counter. Thanks for tuning in and joining us. I just want to invite you to sing along with us as we worship together. Conquers all anxiety. So let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark, and it changes everything. And we sing with all we are, and we claim your victory. So let it rise.
Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song. You are good. You are good. good. Let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the wind. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo. Thank you for joining me here today. We are back in our series, New Kingdom People, but it's kind of taking a new twist. You know, we've been looking at what Jesus said when he preached that very famous sermon of his, the Sermon on the Mount. We've been looking at the Beatitudes, which are a list of blessings at the beginning of that sermon. And basically Jesus was saying, this is what it looks like to be a part of my kingdom. Uh, when you are living with, with me reigning in your life, when I am your king, I'm your savior, I'm leading the way for you, then this is what your life is going to be like. And it's going to be blessed. doesn't mean you won't suffer. In fact, many of the people hearing that message became followers of his and really did suffer. But he said there is a blessing. There's, a, there's things that happen internally that are beyond anything this world can offer. So what we're going to be doing here now in the next few weeks is to go beyond the Sermon on the Mount and actually get to meet some of the people who interface with Jesus, some of the people whose lives were deeply changed by Jesus. In fact, today we're going to look in on a situation where a man, where Jesus confronted a man that was literally racked by demons. He was being controlled and influenced by demons. You know, it was in 1973 that the famous movie the Exorcist came out. And I realize if you're younger, you may be thinking, 1973, I can't even think back that far. I can't even, you know, that just sounds like ancient history. But back in 1973, The Exorcist was actually a super popular movie. In fact, I think it's one of the highest grossing uh, movies in, in the horror movie category of all time. 
But when it came out, everybody was talking about demons and demon possession and is Satan real and all that and kind of sensationalized it all. The movie uh, was, I guess, very loosely lit based on some actual events, but it was very, very, you know, Hollywood-esque. But people were talking about it, thinking about it. It was uh, definitely, uh, you know, kind of the, the conversation of the day. But then it sort of, you know, passed and other things became popular and people stopped talking about it. When I think about demons today, I think there's two extremes people can get into. One is that they just see demons under everything, like everything that goes wrong, you know, well, the devil made me do it, uh, kind of thing. And then there's the other extreme, which is just completely ignoring the demonic realm, ignoring the reality that we are in a spiritual war. And scripture is very clear that the whole demon world is very real. Satan and those that work for Satan are very, very real. So this story sort of brings to light that reality, and I want you to get into it with me today. It's in Mark chapter 5. I think you're going to just love this, and we're going to dive right into it. I think it's a fascinating look at how Jesus loves people deeply and wants to deal with their spiritual oppression. And as we get into this, I just also want to challenge you. You may be thinking, well, I don't feel demon-possessed, and I don't know anybody that seems demon-possessed to me, but let me just have you look at it this way. Satan is always at work. There are situations where it's very overt and we can tell, hey, that person is clearly being influenced by demons, but then so much of his work is much more covert and we don't really see how he's working, but scripture is so clear that he is working against us. He, he is seeking to devour people that love Jesus, to just wreck their lives. Uh, he doesn't have control of their soul, but he can sure ruin their experience of walking with Jesus uh, and, and really make it rough for them. So let's get into this and, and see what God has to show us today. It says in Mark chapter 5, verse 1, that they, that's Jesus and his disciples, went across the lake. Now, in the chapter before, in Mark chapter 4, you notice that Jesus has just done that miracle of calming the storm. So the disciples have had a you know, already an incredible experience with Jesus on the lake. But then they continue to cross, it says, across the lake to the region of the Gerizines. Now, to, for us to read that, we could just easily pass by that and not even think about it. But for a Jew of that day to go across the lake was a really big deal because the area across the lake was the area called the Decapolis or 10 cities, Deca, 10, Polis, city. And there were 10 very, very pagan Gentile cities in that area. It was considered to be a dark, uh, demonic area. No Jew, especially no Jewish rabbi, would ever go across the lake. So when you see that phrase there, they went across the lake, any Jew hearing the story would have been like, you know, gasping, like, you're kidding, they went across the lake? And it, so it really helps us to have a little context for that. The other interesting thing is, as we get into the story, is to realize that across the lake, you know, because they were all, uh, they had all these pagan worship rites, one of the, the uh, pagan uh, statues that they worshiped was a statue of a pig. These people actually worshiped pigs. Now, think about a pig to the Jews, that's just completely the opposite of everything that's good and holy to a Jew. They would never eat uh, pork, for instance. So you can just imagine the contrast here. So these guys are going into an area across the lake where they're actually worshiping pork or worshiping pigs, which was just anathema to any Jew of the day. So that helps us kind of get a sense of the context here. They arrived over on the other side of the lake and something wild happened. It says, verse two, when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. Now we read the word impure spirit and that just sounds so tame. So it's good that they filled in the blanks here and helped us really understand what this guy's life was like. Uh, it's not that this guy had a purity problem. It means that this, this was a spirit from Satan, a totally ungodly spirit. Uh, Matthew tells us there were actually two men involved in this scenario, but Mark here just focuses in on one of the men that were there. And uh, it's interesting, it also says that he came out from the tombs to meet him. So this guy is living among the tombs there on the edge of the lake. I've ever actually been to that area. It's a fantastic archeological dig. Uh, there is a, a church that was built there a few centuries later. Um, that is, I think it's fifth century. Uh, and 
that church, the foundation of that church is still very much there. It's a, and it was built on this site to commemorate this in this event. But this word came out or came out to meet them. That is literally the same word that is used of a, uh, um, a military, it's a military term of going out to meet an opponent. So there's this idea in that term that this guy was coming in a kind of an attacking frame of mind. So he came toward Jesus. Uh, he, we might say he came at him. So look at verse three. The man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. If you go to that archeological site today, you will see right up on the hill there, right next to the, the, the dig where they've dug up this fifth century church, there are all these caves in the hillside which would have been used for first century tombs. It was very common for people to bury the dead in caves, just much easier than digging out of stone. Uh, and they would also bring food to the dead. It was kind of a, a ritual. Um, and so these guys that were out of their minds would just be living in these areas because it was a, a shelter. They were, uh, as you can see in this guy here, he was just out of control. So he could be living off the food that people would bring to the tombs. It was shelter for him. It was kind of a gruesome place to live, but it gave them a place to live. He's possessed by an evil spirit of some sort and, uh, and he's in bad shape. We, we learn here that he's strong, he's violent, he's kind of crazy, he's out of his mind, he's out of control, and, uh, and nobody could restrain him. They just simply couldn't help him. So they've probably just given up on him and he's out there cutting himself and you can just imagine him out there at night, just howling and screaming and uh, being tortured. It's just really, really a, a bad scene. Kind of thinks, it reminds me of a Stephen King novel. Uh, I've actually never read a Stephen King novel. It reminds me of what I imagine a Stephen King novel would sound like. So watch what happens. Look at verse six. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, come out of this man, you impure spirit. So Jesus has already addressed the fact that this man is demon possessed. He's already addressed the spirit in this man. And this man comes out growling at him. Uh, what do you want with me? Get away from me. Don't torture me. Uh, what's really interesting is that the, these demons are really speaking through the man's voice. And uh, it's interesting that they recognize who he is. And this, this, this man here would have no idea who Jesus was. I mean, in his natural state, he wouldn't have any idea. Uh, he's a Gentile. He's from this area. He wouldn't know anything about Jesus. And yet, because these demons are filling this man and they're speaking out through his voice, they know exactly who Jesus is. I think that's fascinating. In the spirit world, everybody knows who Jesus is. Um, the demons know who Jesus is. James tells us that they know who Jesus is, uh, and they're frightened of him, um, and they're under, they are under his authority. So that's why they're shouting at Jesus here. Uh, notice that this man, <clears throat> um, well, let me read you one more verse here. Verse nine, then Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. Legion, I want you to notice that for a minute. So Jesus is literally addressing the demon in this man and the name of this, this man or this demon that is controlling this man is Legion. Uh, Legion was a military uh, installment of about 6,000 men in Roman times. So we don't know how many demons were in this guy, but it's clear that the point of that is there, are, there were a lot. This man was really being oppressed by the devil, possessed by the devil. And um, it's, it's also interesting that, that, uh, that they, it says there in verse 10, then this, this, this demon inside of him, it says that he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. So these demons are localized. They seem to be thriving in a particular environment. I think this is very true. Um, when we open ourselves up to Satan, when we, when we 
in some way we just make ourselves vulnerable to him or we're not living in the power of the spirit, there is, there is all sorts of opportunity for Satan to work himself into our life, uh, kind of create a wedge in our relationships, create antagonism, create anger, create addictions, create all sorts of problems. And, and we might just see those as human problems, but I really think Satan has a lot of influence. And I, we don't know, we don't understand the dem demonic world. We don't understand how it all works. So we don't know what is uh, demonic activity per se, but we do know for sure that Satan is at work in people's lives, in their hearts, and, and his work is always set out to destroy them. And the demons that are under Satan's control are uh, committed to that same, that same effort, that same goal. So how they all work, what, you know, people try to define, well, is this, you know, demons at work or is this Satan at work? Nobody knows. The point is it's evil oppression, it's evil power, and there's all th sorts of ways that we can make ourselves vulnerable to that uh, when we stop really staying close to God and His power and being filled with the Spirit and staying in prayer, as we're gonna see here in just a few minutes, there are things that we can do to make sure that we are uh, reinforcing ourselves and, and keeping ourselves aligned with God so we have spiritual strength and spiritual protection. That's very important. So there's a lot of demons in this guy and Satan is, or, or Jesus is gonna address this now. So I want you to look now at verse 11. Let me just read it here out of scripture because it's a little bit longer of, of a section. Uh, it says there in, Mark 5:11. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, "Send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them." He gave them permission, and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. If you go to that site today, like I mentioned, this archaeological dig that's there, it is on a steep bank and it is still to this day used for, for grazing, uh, livestock and so forth. So you can just imagine these pigs running down this hill and right down into the lake. Um, those tending the pigs, now imagine the owners of the pigs weren't super excited about this, those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside and the people went out to see what had happened. So the owners go to town, they go to their friends and say, you won't believe what just happened. This guy comes off this boat, he's got authority. He cast the demons out of that guy that's been running around in the tombs, the crazy guy. Uh, and, and he you know, freed him of this spiritual oppression, these, these spirits, these demons, and the demons went into our pigs and the pigs have now been destroyed. So these people all come together and they come out to see Jesus and they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there dressed and in his right mind. So imagine the contrast now. Before he looks like he's crazed and tearing out his hair and cutting himself and, and just out of control. And now here's the same man sitting there. The people see him and he's totally calm. Imagine what a shock that would have been to these people. It's like, how is this possible? Is this the same guy that we saw before who was just out of control? And indeed it was. Uh, but it's interesting that I want you to see their reaction. Like, I'm thinking I'd be like, dude, like running up to the guy, like, you look awesome. You know, like, this is amazing. This is the best day ever. But look at what happens. The people see him sitting there dressed in his right mind and they were afraid. It says they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. So that gives us some clue as to what they're afraid of. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. They're so afraid of him, they want him to get out. They're afraid because they don't want his authority in their life. These people were very concerned about the pigs, and they realized this man has spiritual authority. This person who's, who's done this, he is powerful. And I wonder if they're even thinking, man, if he's that spiritually powerful, what would he see in me? I mean, if he has that kind of spiritual insight, spiritual power, they would just thought, this is just too much. This guy's got to leave. We got to get rid of him. Uh, who knows what kind of influence Satan was having over them as well in wanting him to get out of their, get out of their region. But everything about this whole encounter just 
reveals the power of Christ. Think about it. Out on the lake, Mark chapter 4, Jesus demonstrates his power over all nature. He calms the storm. If you can calm a storm on a sea, you can do anything in the natural world. And now here he is in this situation with this, this individual that is being destroyed by satanic influences, by, by evil, and Jesus steps right into that and demonstrates his power, his authority in that situation as well. Well, the pig owners, they're furious. They don't care uh, uh, about the man. They don't care that his life has been changed. All they're concerned is about the pigs. Uh, I, I think, you know, we got to give it to them in this sense that this was their livelihood. These pigs meant a lot to them. Uh, we don't care that much about pigs, but I mean, this was a lot of pigs, 2,000 in their herd. Uh, think of it this way. Maybe if Jesus came and sent the, the uh, demons into 2,000 cars, brand new cars on a car lot, and all the cars started up and drove off a cliff and smashed, we might be like, oh, that's pretty big impact, uh, pretty big economic impact. Well, I think might, might have been what some of these farmers are feeling like. I just lost all my pigs. So why did Jesus do that? Well, I think he's making a, maybe a couple of points. One is this man's life is worth more than you realize. I think that might have been part of it. Uh, those people worshiped their pigs. Those pigs were very valuable to him. And yet, in a sense, I think Jesus was saying, you know what, I, I'd even destroy this whole herd of pigs to save this one man. I don't know, that's just conjecture on my part, but it's certainly consistent with the way Jesus operated. Um, the other thing is I, I think that maybe it has to do with the fact that they were worshiping the pig. I mean, like the pig was a sacred animal to them. It's almost as if Jesus is putting the demons in the pigs uh, and, and you know, giving the demons what they wanted, which was to go into these pigs, because he, he wanted the people to realize Satan is in the very thing that you are worshiping. Satan is behind all that. Um, and I don't know, it just seems kind of uncanny that it's like the people worship pigs and then these demons wanna go into the pigs and Jesus says, sure, go ahead. It's kind of like they already had control of the pig uh, in the first place because that was the, the focus of the people's worship. So I don't know, it's very interesting. It's a fascinating account. But the bigger reality is that Jesus is demonstrating his love for this man and he's demonstrating his power over the whole spiritual realm. I think this story brings a couple of things to mind that I want to just leave you with here as we land this. The first is this, Satan's power is real. Don't underestimate it. Satan's power is real. Don't underestimate it. Um, John Calvin wrote this. He says, the devil holds us as his slaves till the son of God delivers us from his tyranny. Naked, torn, and disfigured, we wander about till he restores us to soundness of mind. It'd be very easy for us to underestimate Satan's power because for many of us, we don't feel like this direct influence. Many of us may not even be aware that we're being influenced or, or oppressed uh, or tempted by evil, uh, by Satan, but it's a reality. Scripture is very clear about it. I think there's, there's sort of a danger in our Western culture where we're not really, we're, we're kind of desensitized to the whole spiritual realm. Um, and so there can be this tendency in people to just forget about it, not even think, whether they're Christians or non-Christians, just not just kind of put it off the radar. Uh, but the truth is Satan is real and he wants to destroy the walk of any Christian. And he certainly wants to keep unbelievers uh, from even seeing the beauty of the gospel. But we're all like this man in that sense. And I think that's what John Calvin's statement is, is, is so powerful. Um, we're all being held in some way. Uh, Satan is having influence in our lives uh, and, until the Son of God just comes in and delivers us by his grace. And I don't know where you're at in your own spiritual journey today, but I would just say this, man, just know that everything that's Everything about scripture makes it so clear that Satan is out to destroy. Jesus even said that he comes like a thief. He comes to destroy, to steal and to destroy. But Jesus said, but I have come to give you life. What a contrast. I've come to give you life and life abundant. 
So I would just say today, if, if anything, you get anything out of this message, it would be this, just surrender yourself to the grace of God that is so great for you, regardless of where you've been in your past. We all come like this man, just naked and torn and out of our minds. And, and we just come and we fall before the Lord and he begins to rebuild our life by his grace. So it's not like this guy's story is like some wacko thing way out there. This is what we all really truly are like. I think this story just sort of brings it to light. So I would just ask you, um, all of you, whether you're a believer or, or still on your spiritual journey toward Christ, do you think that Satan is in any, in any way trying to influence you away from God or away from the truth? And if you can identify anything like that, I would just say today's story is a great time to just stop, reconsider what kind of influence you're allowing into your life. And one of the ways I think he gets in and works his evil in our lives is when we trivialize sin, when we make it seem like sin isn't that big of a deal, but he actually uses it to work his way into our life and to destroy our lives. The second thing that I think this story brings to light is this. Jesus brings light to the darkest places. Uh, don't write anybody off. Jesus brings light to the darkest places. Don't write anybody off. It would be so easy for us to look at this guy and just kind of pass him by and just think, man, he's such a mess, you know. I don't think there's any chance that he would respond to the Messiah. And yet he did. Jesus went right uh, for the jugular. He just dealt with this guy's pain and this guy's life was changed. I think we have a tendency to think certain people are beyond hope or other people may be really interested in Jesus. But I would just say we're all kind of beyond hope apart from the grace of God reaching in and grabbing our hearts. So don't write anybody off. Um, and, and even those of us who follow Jesus, I mean, I think sometimes we get off track and there's this tendency to us, in us to feel like, could Jesus really love me? And maybe that person you're ten, tending to write off today is yourself. I meet people like that all the time and just feel like, man, I, I just got so off track. I don't, I don't see how Jesus can even work with me anymore. And yet I would say he, he loves to step into stories like that and turn them around and redeem what appears to be an impossible situation. Henry Nouwen writes, we so often fail to come close to God because we cannot possibly believe that God would be kind enough to care about us, to provide us with answers, to give us hope, and to gently renew us. We need eyes to see, and seeing eyes are eyes of faith, eyes that look beyond the problem, eyes that look beyond our own unworthiness, eyes that look with confidence to God of all grace and mercy. That man is sitting there in his right mind. He's clothed, he's calm. He's a, he's a testimony to God's work in a person's life. Let me pick up the story again at verse 18. It says, as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him but go, but said, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. What a powerful ending to this story. I mean, this man, he's thinking, man, this is the best thing that ever happened to me. This has completely changed my life. Let me go with you, Jesus. I, I'll get in the boat with you. I'll be one of your disciples. Let's go have a Bible study, whatever. And Jesus says, no, you're going to be critical. You're going to be bringing the good news to this region because of what God has done for you. Uh, so here's the third thing I want us to catch. God works through people to reach people. Don't miss your opportunity. God works through people to reach people. That means he's working through you and me. We don't want to miss our opportunity. This guy had a unique opportunity. He had a powerful testimony because of what God had done for him. And regardless of how God has worked in your life in the past, he has specific people that he's going to take you to, that your own story is going to, is going to matter to, people that need to hear from you how God has worked in you. Don't miss that opportunity. This guy just wanted to go be with Jesus because that would be easier. And Jesus was sending him right back to those people that needed to hear from him. And I think it also demonstrates to us that Jesus uses us all. 
we sometimes have this tendency to think, well, I don't know enough, or I don't have all the answers, or I haven't studied the Bible enough. But let me just ask you this. How much do you think that man knew of the scriptures? I would say, not at all. He didn't know any of the scriptures. How much do you think he knew about Jesus? I can assure you he didn't know any more about Jesus than what Jesus had just done for him. In a sense, was it risky? Yeah, it was risky. Probably a lot of things this guy couldn't answer that people might have asked him. And yet, he was a testimony to the power of God. If you've been changed by Jesus, you have a testimony. If you've been changed by Jesus, he wants to use you in other people's lives. And it, does, it doesn't have to be complicated. Just tell him what Jesus has done for you. Um, it says, verse 20, So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. He went away and did just the very thing that Jesus told him to do. The people were amazed at the power of God in this man's life. Bob Thune and Will Walker wrote a book called The Gospel-Centered Gospel Life. They wrote this, To put it simply, the grace of God is always going somewhere, moving forward, extending his kingdom, propelling his people toward love and service to others. As we learn to live in light of the gospel, mission should be the natural outflow. God's grace brings renewal internally in us so that it might bring renewal externally through us. What Jesus did was to found a missionary movement that would one day span the globe. If you're a follower of Jesus, you don't have to start a missionary movement. You're already in one. This guy was the first missionary Jesus sent out. He was a new kingdom person. He was a person who had encountered Jesus and now Jesus sent him out back to his people, back to this region that didn't know anything about, about God and his love for them. Um, so it just reminds me once again that today that God is just anxious to work through anybody who has surrendered to him. Jesus used, I think, this story in scripture uh, in a number of ways. One, he uses it to get our attention about the reality of the demon world, uh, the reality of spiritual influences, the reality of Satan in our lives. I think he also uses it to expose the agenda of Satan. He wants, to, he wants to steal, he wants to destroy, and he destroys lives all the time. Um, and I think it also is, it's, it's a story that helps us stop and assess our own lives and ask ourselves, am I personally aligned with Jesus? Am I every, every single day seeking his power to be at work in my life, to protect me from all those influences that would pull me away from him and ultimately create destruction in my life? I think Ephesians chapter six is a great place to land this. It's, uh, it's written by Paul to the church at Ephesus. Ephesus was a city that Paul went to share the gospel with, and it was a place that was filled with demons. In fact, in Acts chapter 19, where it describes Paul's visit to Ephesus, there's all these stories interwoven into the historical narrative about demons and their work in the people and how they were influencing people to worship idols and all of this stuff. And then back to that same church that had been established there to Ephesus, uh, Paul writes these words. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to take your stand and after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. In other words, he's just using all this, this, you know, this, this outfit to, to realize that our power, our strength, and our protection is all coming from these spiritual practices of prayer, and seeking God, and being in his word, staying close to him. And he says then very personally, 
Verse 18, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert. And I think he means there, be spiritually alert. Be aware that your enemy prowls around like a roaring lion looking to devour God's people. He says, stay alert. Keep on praying for all the Lord's people. That is our spiritual protection. Pray also for me, he says, that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. He was writing this from prison and he's writing back to these people and saying, just keep praying for me. That is my spiritual protection. Yeah, he, he knew he was in prison, but what he was really concerned about was the spiritual realm. He wanted to be spiritually protected and that's why he asked those people to pray for him. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank you for this amazing story. And I, it's one that I absolutely love because it, it is such a showcase for your power. I pray that today everybody who's listening here would take it personally and do a personal spiritual inventory of their own spiritual life because we are spiritual people. And I pray that you would help identify any areas in our lives where we are we are giving a foothold for Satan to have influence in our minds and in our hearts. And I pray, Lord, that we would be drawn to these practices every single day, spending time with you in your word, seeking to be so close to you that we have that spiritual protection only you can provide. I thank you, Lord, today that you are reminding us about the bigger reality than just the things that are right in front of us, that there it really is a spiritual war and we are really in a spiritual struggle. And thank you that you've already won the war. Help us with our little battles every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Encounter. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So leave behind your regrets. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes Come today, there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy From the ashes a new life is born But Jesus is calling Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Wonderful 
Christ is risen. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. That is our prayer today. That your spirit reign in us, would live through us. Thank you for meeting us here in this place, for hearing our song. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks again for joining us this weekend. Have an amazing week. We'll see you next time. <laughs>